So our class today is the first class of our basic series. Let's start at the very beginning, getting to know Family Search. And I need to say up front that this is a very basic class. And I fully realize that there will be people on the the, in the class today who aren't at the basic level. So I hope that many of you are because this is going to really, really start at the, the very most basic level. So it'll be perfect for you. But even if you, or I hope it will be at least, uh, but even if you're beyond that, then hopefully the class will help you get ideas for maybe how you can help other beginners. So we hope that no matter what level you're at, that this class will be helpful to you today. So, I wanted to just let you know what to expect over the next four weeks, that we, and we hope that you will join us over the next four weeks. So today we're having our first class, get, Getting to Know Family Search. Next week, we'll do Adding and Correcting Information in Family Tree. Next week after that is Finding People to Add to Family Tree, which is one of the most exciting classes. And then Class 4 might seem a little bit puzzling. So it's called Tending Your Tree Basic Research Skills. And you might be saying, hey, wait a minute. Don't I need basic research skills to get started? And my answer is, I actually used to teach this way. I've been teaching family history for... I don't know, 15 years or something, quite a while. And so I used to start out teaching people basic research skills. What I found was, number one, it can be a little dry, honestly. We try to make it fun, but it can be a little dry. One of the reasons I think it's dry is that you don't have any context when you're starting out. So if I just say step one, step two, step three, and you have no idea what the context is or how you'd actually apply this information, then it becomes tedious. And that's actually where a lot of people give up. So we kind of decided to switch things up with our curriculum. And we will first kind of do some hands on things. We've got um, act, uh, handouts that give you activities that you can do out of class and will demonstrate a lot of things. The th first three weeks will give you the context that will be helpful to you in understanding the fourth week of basic research skills. And then you'll get into it, go, oh, yeah, okay, I totally get what she's saying when she says like set a goal or whatever this you know the census or whatever we might talk about in that class so that's my hope is that this class will lead you along in a fun and interesting way to get involved in family history and so that being said let me kind of reiterate the purpose of this class what we are really hoping to do is inspire confidence and ongoing involvement not just a flash in the pan check my box off i've done family history now i'm never going to touch it again but instead we hope that you'll have a lifelong love affair with family history. And the way we want to do that is to provide you with context, which I feel is so critical. We've got to have the big picture, right? If we only have a little piece of the picture, it's too easy to get lost and even discouraged. And then we also want to teach practical skills, not just theoretical stuff, but how can you actually do your family history? And then finally, we want to highlight joy. Joy is a huge purpose of family history. And I have to tell you that some of the most joyful experiences of my life are connected with family history. And I hope that as we take this journey together, that it will be the same for you, that you will find great joy in ongoing involvement in temple and family history work. Learning to do family history is actually a lot like learning to drive. It's really not that hard. Most of us can do it. There are some exceptions, maybe some physical limitations or so forth, but most people can learn to drive without too much difficulty. But like drivers, you need to know some things. Particularly, we need to know the quote rules of the road. And then also we need to know how to operate the vehicle. And just like we wouldn't give our 15 and a half year old or whatever age people are learning to drive in your location, just like we wouldn't give a teenager the keys to the car with no instruction and say, hey, have fun, go out on the freeway, uh, good luck. We would never do that. We, it would be asking for serious trouble. Well, in family history, it's a little bit the same way that sometimes 
historically, we've been so afraid of driving people away by giving them some instruction that we don't give them much instruction at all. And then we just say, okay, here's the keys to the car, go out there and good luck. And what I found in teaching people is that's actually very discouraging because they kind of know that they don't know what they need to know to be successful in family history. So we hope that through this series of classes, it will give you some of those tools to feel confident and feel like you can move ahead and make this a regular part of your life. So starting advice, especially to those of you who are new, because I remember when I first started doing family history, it was a black box to me. I had no clue what to do, what to expect. And not only that, I knew I didn't know. So it was very intimidating. So my starting advice, if you're feeling that way, is number one, relax. Try not to be stressed. I know that's easy for me to say, right? But try not to be stressed. Just relax and know that you're going to get the help that you need and that um, you can be peaceful about it and you can consider this the start of your journey. And then the other hugely important thing that I cannot emphasize enough is to listen today for what the Spirit will teach you. What I say won't have near the value any words I could say would not have the same value as what the spirit will speak to your heart the spirit may confirm to you that some things I've said are true or the spirit may give you a completely different direction or something that just really has nothing to do with what we're talking about but it's customized guidance for you so that would be my um my encouragement and invitation today is for each of us, no matter what level you're at, to listen for what the Spirit will teach you. So that being said, here are the four topics that we're going to cover today. First of all, the key to family history, and you might be just thinking in your mind what that might possibly be. Then we'll do a brief introduction to family search. And this is really fun, actually. It's one of my favorite parts to talk about. It's a little known story of how family search actually came to be. And then we'll, we will get to know Family Tree a little bit, its structure and its navigation and so forth. Oh, wait. OK. Um, I got this backwards or out of order and we're recording this great Murphy's Law so I, I messed it up on the recording oh well. So the introduction to family search is just going to briefly go over like what the family search website is and then we'll get to know family tree the structure of it and um, how information is presented and then on the last one we will talk about how to navigate in family tree so that you know how to get around and find the information that you need. Maybe we can edit the part I did wrong out of the video, Elder Farnsworth. <laughs> and if not, it's not a big deal. We corrected it. So what do you think would be the key to family history? Well, I don't know that there's a right or a wrong answer to that, but I'll share with you what I think the key is to family history. And that is to seek and rely on the spirit. I love this scripture. You might recognize the context of it. You remember when the Savior came to visit the people in the Americas right after his resurrection. He visited with them. And as you can imagine, it would be a pretty intense day. And at the end, he said, I'm going away now, but I will come back tomorrow. And in the meantime, while you're waiting for me to come back, please prepare yourselves. Well, how did they prepare themselves? One of the things they did was they did pray for that which they most desired. And they desired that the Holy Ghost should be given unto them. It's the same thing that we want to do with family history. And that's one of the biggest ways I think that we feel joy in family history is as it is, is seeking and relying on the spirit. Family history actually is one of the best tutorials in learning to recognize and follow the spirit. Do you guys ever wonder if you're hearing the spirit? I do. There's times when I'm not confident or, you know, was that just my own idea? Was that really the spirit speaking to me? One of the things that has helped me probably the most in my life to grow in my ability to hear the spirit is doing family history. So what I've noticed, I struggled with maybe how to communicate this, but what I've noticed over the years is that the Holy Ghost seems to have a family history channel. 
So what I mean by that is, I'm sure that all of us or most of us have felt the spirit in different ways at different times in our lives, a warning of danger or a prompting to serve someone. There's a specific sort of feeling to the guidance that comes from the Holy Ghost when it pertains to family history. I, I think maybe that's when we speak of the spirit of Elijah, which President Nelson has taught is a manifestation of the Holy Ghost. I think that might be what we're talking about is this kind of family history channel that we can tune into. So what plays on the family history channel? You can tell the the most important things that you should be doing in family history. You can discern the best things to do. You can correct and avoid mistakes. You can find a starting place. That's often one of the most puzzling things for people, especially when we're just starting out, is where do I start? The spirit is a huge help there. The spirit can guide us in giving and receiving help. And then also the spirit can guide us to use technology wisely. I need a drink here, excuse me. So my invitation to all of us today is to use family history to grow, <clears throat> excuse me, in our ability to hear and follow the spirit, not just in every aspect of our life, because it will do that, but also in our ability to do family history, to hear those promptings about where we should focus, who we should be looking for, who we could help. So keep that in mind as you do your family history. Let it be your lab, if you will, or your, your tutorial to grow in the principle of revelation. Okay, let's do our introduction to the amazing family search. So I wanted to bring up one thing at the beginning. What exactly is family search? And I'm going to make a little bit of a fine distinction, but I mentioned this just because people have been puzzled over it in the past. So when we say family search, we may be referring to one of two things. One is that family search is a family history organization sponsored by the church. They've got headquarters out in Lehigh. They have um, managers that that uh, supervise the work they have employees and so forth they actually used to be the genealogical society of utah and then it they decided that they needed a more global name which thank goodness i am so glad because family search does sound way more global way more inclusive and that's not to criticize how the the utah genealogical society started it had to start someplace but then as they realized hey we want to expand our reach and do the work of the lord we're going to have to expand our name as well so here we've got family search so it's an organization but it's also we use it to refer to a website which is run by the organization and so mostly in our class today we're going to be using it to refer to the website so i hope that's helpful one thing i love about the familysearch.org website is that it is organized in a very clear way for the most part there's a couple of places that i think some of us would change if we could but for the most part it's very well organized and the main categories are shown on this top menu, which is accessible from just about any page on the website. There are a couple of exceptions, but for the most part, you're going to see this top level menu on every page of Family Search. So you can easily get to any location that you need to get to. So just to give you an overview, let's take a quick tour of the main sections of the FamilySearch.org website. Family tree is where we are building a shared pedigree, and it's also where we manage temple work. And when I say manage, that's a little bit, that wasn't really the right word. It's where we prepare families to receive their temple work. So it's a very important part of the Family Search website. And then we go to search, which is historical records. These are the amazing, wonderful records that give us information about our family, which enables us to add them to family tree so their temple work can be done. We're talking about things like birth records, marriage records, death records, census records, and others. Memories is a very fun place for a lot of us. This is where we can upload photos, stories, 
documents, and audio recordings. People always ask if we can upload videos, and right now we're, we can't do that. Although, if you have a video, say, on a Vimeo channel or a YouTube channel, you can link to it, but you can't actually upload a video, like a family reunion video or something. Cannot upload that to memories. But honestly, I haven't found that to be a huge limitation. I think a lot of us, what we're mostly interested in is uploading the photos so that we've got some record of our family. Well, memories is where you do it. We won't dive deep into that, but if you're interested in more information, we actually have a number of webinars. If you Google BYU FHL webinars. You'll find the webinar page that lists all of the webinars that have been given. And there are, oh, I want to say probably five or six on memories, possibly more. So that's a great way to get more information. Indexing. If we were in an in-person class, I would ask for a show of hands of how many people have indexed. I bet it's a lot of you. And I will say thank you from the bottom of my heart to everybody who's done indexing. I see two people raise their hands, their Zoom hands. So maybe they're saying that they did um, indexing. Six, seven. Yeah, why don't you do that? If you have indexed, click the raise hand. And it just gives me a number of people. So I see it just jamming up. I'm up we're up to 60. 70, 73. So thank you to all of you who have done indexing, because what you've done is make it possible for the rest of us to find our family. So that's what happens on the indexing portion of the site. Then we've got a fun place called activities, and this just has a bunch of different activities, trivia games or trivia um, not not exactly games, but they'll let you they'll show you trivia like from your birth year, things like that. And those are really good for, for example, a family home evening or maybe a young men's young women's activity. This compare face here is actually a blast. You have to upload your own photo, but then it's it compares your photo with artificial intelligence to anybody else on your tree and it computes a percentage of your highest, like it computes a percentage of how much you match other people on your tree. What was really weird is I don't match anybody in my immediate family. I match like closest, like 80% or something, this second great aunt. And so somehow she and I ended up with a lot of the same DNA. And this is just a fun thing. There's all kinds of fun stuff on here. So that's a great thing to explore. And then finally, the last section, is the temple section. This is where the names appear that you have reserved to do temple ordinances for. So it's a very important part of the tree of the of familysearch.org. Today's focus is going to be family tree because that is really where the bulk of the of our temple and family history work happens. So I would like to share with you the story of Family Tree. We talked about giving context. I was blown away when I heard this story. When I started working in Family Tree first, I had no idea of what had what it had taken to get to where we are today. So in order to tell you the story of Family Tree, I want to introduce you to one of my heroes. His name is Harry Russell. Harry joined the church when he was age 43. This was back in 1912. He not only had a strong testimony of the restored gospel, but particularly family history. He loved it, and he devoted a great deal of his life to doing family history. In fact, a book came into his possession for his Abbott family. He had some Abbott um, progenitors. And so from that book, he actually went to the temple for 360 days and did temple work from this book. If you can imagine the time, effort, and sacrifice that that took. Then he went to St. George. He visited his family. They had the same book. Guess what they were doing? Yeah. So he was just heartbroken. He was like, okay, so I just did all that temple work and it was being duplicated by my other family members and I could have used that time to do temple work for people who really needed it. Well, the trials in our lives often lead to good results, right? And I think this from reading about his story, and I'll actually give you the book that tells his story. 
I would give you the reference to the book, excuse me. Um, he did exactly that. He took something that was discouraging and difficult and said, and he had the foresight to realize that if this happened with his family, how many other families was it going to happen with, especially as the church grew? And he thought to himself, we can't do this. We can't go ahead and have people duplicating ordinances and leaving other people with their ordinances undone. So long story short, he actually made a proposal to church leadership to have a church-wide clearinghouse to avoid duplication. So at the time, if I remember the story correctly, we only had six operating temples and each temple kept their records separately. So remember, this is the early 1900s. There's no internet. The fastest way to communicate, as I recall, recall was the telegraph. And then of course the telephone came a bit later, but even those things wouldn't really be the best way to share family history ordinances between temples. And so so he said, we've got to have a central place where we track ordinances. And the very first iteration of that was called the Temple Index Bureau or the TIB, if you've heard people talk about that. We can thank dear brother Russell for having that idea, which I am quite sure was under inspiration. And then also for the church leaders who accepted that inspiration and acted on it and created the Temple Index Bureau pre-computer it was card file but they did what they could with what they had they tracked the information and this became the basis for family tree today we could say that the tib is the ancestor of family tree so out of small things precedes that which is great and we are blessed we're standing on the shoulders of giants who made such great sacrifices to get us the information that we need and the very names that they entered in the tib those names many of them you will find in family tree today so if you'd like to learn more about this amazing story, I would recommend to you this book called Hearts Turn to the Fathers. This was originally published by BYU Studies. This is a live link and will give you the link to the slide deck at the end of this class. So you can actually click on this link and get to the PDF version of the book. But if you would prefer a um, Deseret Book friendly version, and I don't work for Deseret Books, so I'm not you know, getting a commission out of this, but if you would like to buy the um, the version that you can read on Deseret Book, uh, I forgot what their proprietary reader is called, but they've got a proprietary reader you know, that you can read a bunch of Deseret Book books on. This is also available for that proprietary reader. And last time I checked it, it was such a reasonable price. It was like, 9.99 us dollars or something not sure how that translates to british pounds or anything but I, I it was i thought it was very reasonable and so if you're interested in this either check out the pdf or um buy the book from deseret book and this is the history of family history in the church and it is the most fascinating story of hardship and sacrifice and miracles that have happened over the years to further the work of the Lord in family history. Okay, so with that as context, let's talk about this miracle called family tree that we use to do our temple and family history work today. So it's important to understand the goal of family tree. It is ultimately to have one complete accurate record for each person who has ever lived on the earth linked to other records by correct relationships. Now that's pretty much a, a definition of a pedigree, right? But if we look at it this way, I don't know, it just seems more real to me. We're trying to connect families, and we're trying to make sure that nobody is forgotten. Family tree is a shared tree. So it's not like a site like Ancestry or MyHeritage or others where you have your private tree that you control. Instead, this is a shared tree because we're all working together to create that pedigree of the human family. And you can imagine what a pain it would be to manage temple work if everybody had their private trees. Because in private trees, there's a lot of duplication. And that's fine in a private tree, but not a shared tree. So on FamilySearch.org, in Family Tree, there's no my tree or your tree. 
it's all one tree. But that necessitates something a little bit different from your standard website, your standard family history website. So Family Search made the somewhat difficult decision to make Family Tree what they call open edit. And if you've ever contributed to Wikipedia, you know what that is, that it's basically any registered user can add or change just about anything. There are a few exceptions like royalty. A lot of royalty records have been locked, early church leaders. We as normal users can't change those, but that's a very small percentage of the people in Family Tree. We can add or change just about anything, but with that freedom comes an important responsibility, and that is to make the information as accurate as we possibly can. And to do that, we want to rely on sources. So you might sometimes hear people say that family tree is source centric. Well, it's just a fancy word for saying that anything we contribute to family tree should be supported by trustworthy sources. So where are we today in this miracle called Family Tree? Right now, according to Ron Tanner, who is the product manager over Family Tree, we've got about 1.3 billion names. That is amazing when you think that this started from a tiny card file. Although I would want to point out, this is um, if you joined the call a little bit or this class a little bit early, Elder Farnsworth and I were talking and, and he was giving some great insights about population in the world. One thing that I found very interesting is I Googled to find an estimate for the world's total population over time. So from the time of Adam. And experts estimate that somewhere around 110 billion people have lived on the earth over time. So, and I don't know it, how wholly accurate that is. The trouble is nobody really knows because we don't have good records. So they've just estimated that based on um, their own data. So whether or not that's accurate, I think is not the point. I think we could all agree that there are probably a lot of people that are not in family tree right now. There's a lot of people who are missing. But I don't share that to discourage us. I just share that to say We've got a lot of work to do, but we want to do it in the Lord's way and at the Lord's pace. And he has not said that we have to run faster than we have strength to run. He has asked us to be diligent and faithful. And so as we do that, we're going to be increasing these 1.3 billion names. And honestly, I guess I'm guessing that we're going to find a lot of them during the millennium, but there's still a lot that we can do today. So according to Ron Tanner, the largest single tree in Family Tree has about 465 million names. That's about a third of that 1.3 billion. Ron said in a Roots Tech talk, it's been a couple years, I believe, that when he first checked to see what the biggest single tree was, he thought it would probably be just mostly the United States or mostly United States, Canada and England, areas that had large numbers of early converts in the church. What he found shocked him. He said that pretty much every country of the world was represented on this largest tree. And he said that that just drove the point home to him that we really are, are all part of a global family and we really are all connected. The rest of the two thirds are all in little fragment trees. So our ultimate goal is to finally get all those people joined in with correct relationships so that ultimately it's that large tree, all of Heavenly Father's children. So we said there's 1.3 billion names in Family Tree right now. Where did they come from? Well, we learned from Harry Russell where some of them came from, early church temple records, and they'll also extracted vital records. That was just the church's early indexing program, what we know as indexing today. Back in the day when they were low on temple names, they would actually take some of those extracted names and give them to patrons who came to the temple. So these names, you will often find them in Family Tree. Church membership records feed information into Family Tree. I found this out when my uncle passed away. As soon as his ward clerk marked him deceased 
and then Family Search did something on their end, his information showed up in Family Tree without us having to do anything. He was an endowed member of the church, so all his ordinance information showed up, his birth date, birthplace, anything that would have been, not anything, but the main things that were on his membership record. So church membership data feeds into Family Tree for deceased people. And then user contributions, which is a growing section of or a growing data source for names in Family Tree. So those names that we add are causing Family Tree to grow, and they are a source of the data of the names in Family Tree. What does this mean for us, though? Well, it means that the quality of information varies widely, and that's OK. Because sometimes I hear people getting upset about that, and I get that. It can be a little frustrating to have somebody do a bad merge or have incorrect information added. But on the other hand, there really isn't any other way that we could build this tree without all working together. So we have to be patient with each other. It's just like life, right? We're all at different levels. So you're going to find different quality of information on Family Tree, and that's OK. The other thing is that duplicate names are an ongoing concern. I honestly find duplicates constantly, that I'll, I'll find somebody has added a name to Family Tree, and yet that name is already there. And so they've added another record and um, sent, said it, shared it with the temple or something. So we want to be careful. Again, doing duplicate temple work certainly doesn't harm the person that we're doing temple work for, right? The person that it really, the person I feel sad for is the person who wanted to have their ordinances done and didn't because I was doing work for somebody that already had their work done. So that's the, the issue with duplicate names. We just want to want to be really careful on that. So the bottom line is that each of us is responsible for the accuracy in family tree. So now with that a little bit of context, let's talk about how you get around in family tree, kind of the structure of it and how you can get from where you are to where you want to go. One of the most important things to be aware of in family tree is that everybody has an identifying string if you want to call it that. It's variously called an ID number, which is a little bit misleading because it's not a number. It's actually composed of letters and numbers. The name I prefer is person ID or PID. Sometimes you'll hear people call it a PID. But whatever you want to call it, it's that. And sometimes people just call it a number or just call it an ID. But whatever people call it, it's that seven character identifier that uniquely identifies a person in family tree. Because how many John Smiths do you think are in family tree? Or how many Diego Martinez's? So there, because many people have the same name, we have to have a way of identifying them uniquely. That's what the PID is for. There are two views, if you will, in family tree, or in other words, two ways to see information. One is a multi-generational view. So it's just what it sounds like. You can see more than one generation at a time. The other view is a person view or an individual view that dives into detail about one specific individual. Now, the summary card, we actually looked at that just a minute ago when we looked at the PID. The summary card is a little pop-up card that comes up with a summary of a person almost any place that you click on a name. So for example, if I click on this name of Joseph Aminadab Quibel, I get a pop-up card. And it just gives some key facts about this person. It gives their name, it gives their PID, it gives a birth date, it gives a death date if available, etc. What I've noticed I wanted to point out to you is that Family Search is in the process of a redesign of their user interface. So you'll see this old style of card, but you'll also see this new style of card. And you see, whoops, sorry, hit the wrong button there. And you see that it has basically the same information with a few little extra buttons down at the bottom. But for the most part, it's just a different way of 
of showing the same information. So just know that if you see that, that is going to give you the little summary. And then what is really great about the summary card is it allows you to navigate to where you want to go. So if you bring up that summary card, say you do it from the person page and you want to get to the tree, then you just click tree on that card or tree over here. And it takes you to the person, or excuse me, to the tree view with this person in the root position. And what we mean by root position is that's just like the center of the tree and everybody else is expressed in relationship to that root person. So you'll have ancestors on one side, you'll have descendants on the other side, but they're all in reference to that root person. And then you can also see person details. So say you were on the tree and you clicked and got the summary card, then you could click person to go to the person page. But one of the best kept secrets is that you can also click the name to get to the person page. I personally prefer clicking the name because it's a little bit bigger, easier to aim for. This is what it looks like on the new card. So you can either click the name or you can click person down in the lower right hand corner and that gets you over to that detail page that we saw a little bit earlier. Another thing that isn't widely known, which was a cool shortcut that I think I actually discovered by accident one day, is that these items right here, the sources, the discussions, and the memories, those are tabs on the person's detail page. If you want to go straight to sources, you can click sources. So clicking the name takes you to the main detail page, but if you want to go straight to the source tab, you can click sources or the discussion tab or the memories tab. And then same thing with the new view of the summary card. So we talked about how the family tree menu is very well organized. And this top menu here gives you an overview of the different sections of the familysearch.org site. Well, another thing that is really cool is when you click on any of these items in the top menu, you get a corresponding secondary menu that gives you functions or features that are specifically for whatever you've chosen. So we've chosen family tree and it's got these six options and we're just going to really quickly go through those again just to give you an idea of what's available. So the overview is just a basic introduction. Honestly, after you've read it once, you probably won't ever need to read it again, but it's definitely worth reading for a time or two. So just know that that's where you can get a basic introduction. The next section is the tree where you see multiple generations. And now let's take just a second to dive into what you can see in the tree because it is so cool. You can see your family information in the way that you want to. There's four different views. So the default view for most people is going to be landscape. And this is what it looks like. Here's our root person. Remember the root person is kind of the center person. And and everybody else is, is shown in relationship to that person. So on the left, I have to be so careful. Do you ever say left when you mean right? I find that I do that more often than I wish I did. So I had to be stop and say, okay, am I saying this correctly? So on the left of the root person, when you're in landscape view, you will see their descendants. And on the right, you will see their ancestors. If you see these little arrows, that means that you can expand the tree. So for instance, here, this arrow would expand, the printing is so small, you guys, sorry. This would expand the family of Joseph Newton Quabell and Ellen Dean. And these other arrows would do the same thing for each of these other couples. And as you might guess, on the other side, we also have arrows that will expand your ancestors. Let me just see how we're doing for time here. Okay. We've still got 40 minutes because I want to leave enough time at the end for questions. So those are the arrows to expand your tree. And another thing that I find is not widely known is that you can drag to position this 
um, tree view any way you want to. It's very much like Google Maps. If you've ever dragged the map to position it in a better way to see what you want to see, same thing here. You just have to put it in any blank area. Like you're not going to be able to drag right on top of a name because if you if you click on a name, it's actually going to give you the summary card. But if you just click and drag on any, sorry, any blank space, you can reposition that tree so that you can see what you need to see. And then over here, of course, you've got your um, plus and minus, which allows you to make the tree bigger or smaller so that it can be exactly what you need it to be to see it. Okay, here are the four different views of tree view. This is very traditional, the landscape view, and that and it's a very useful view. But Family Tree also offers these other views, Portrait, Fan Chart, and Descendancy. So this is Portrait View. Pretty much it is Landscape View flipped on its side. So the root person is still in the center, but it, the descendants are below instead of being off to the left side, and the ancestors are above. And of course, you've got your same arrows like we talked about. So you can click to view more ancestors up at the top, or you can click to view more descendants down at the bottom. So you can see those two views are very similar, but some people, the way their mind works, they just greatly prefer this view. They, it just seems to compute better for them. So if you're one of those people, just switch to portrait and you can use this view for your default view. The fan chart, I have to say, is my favorite view. And I've actually tried to figure out why. And I think that there's probably two reasons. I love the color. I just love the bright, pretty colors. And then also it displays a lot of information in a compact space. So I feel that I can see my family, a lot of information about my family very easily. So on the fan chart, the root person again is in the center, kind of what you would expect. And then above, you've got the ancestors. Below, you've got the descendants. And then only five descendants can be shown here. So if you want to see additional children, and it's only one generation. And if you want to see additional children, you just hit this gray arrow right here. A cool feature that the fan chart has that nobody else has because it's not a fan chart is that if you hover over a um, person, you're going to get a fan icon. And if you click the fan icon, it's going to put that person into the root position. Now, I realized that I kind of, when I said that the other charts don't have that, what I meant is they don't have the fan icon. But actually, on the other charts, let's pop back for a second to, um, if you were to click on any of these people and bring up the summary card, then you could click tree and it would send you that person to the root position. So you can send somebody to the root position. So I didn't want to be confusing about that. But the cool thing about the fan chart is just it has this little icon that comes up. So just know that that will send that person to the root position on the fan. Okay, this is descendancy view. And I will admit to you that I find um, descendancy view to probably be the um, most confusing view for the way my mind works. And so thank goodness that we have different views, right? So all of us can choose the view that works best for us. The way descendancy view works is that the root person is not in the center. Instead, they're at the top. And then if you want to see ancestors, you hit expand to see ancestors um, of that person. And then to see the descendants, you can see that they're kind of laid out in a stair step fashion below the root person. So slightly indented, we've got the root person's spouse. Then we've indented again, we've got their child. And then the, the children are all going to be parallel, except if there's a child that has a spouse, then they are going to be indented yet again. So you can see that you can actually get into a lot of stair steps here. Well, fortunately, you can, uh, and, so, and then the children are indented further. So fortunately, you can expand and collapse branches as you need to. So this down arrow indicates that Anne's branch is expanded right now. So we see her husband and we see her kids. But if we were to click that again, it would close that branch 
and we would just see her. In fact, I think I've got an example. Yeah, on the next page, on the next slide, sorry. Um, Joseph right here has a an arrow facing right. And so we know that he's got more people on his branch, but right now we are not seeing them. And so if we wanted to see them, we would click this arrow and it would drop down and expand the branch to show his wife and kids. And we could drill down as long as there's information in family tree. Okay, we talked about, we're back now to that secondary menu that we were walking through. We talked about overview, we talked about tree, now we're to person. So as you would expect, clicking person takes you to detail about one particular individual. At the top of the person page, there is, oh, and I should add, when you first sign on to family tree, if you click person, it's gonna go to you. But if you have since visited somebody else and you click person, it will take you to your last visited person. So at the top of the person page, we've got yet another menu. And I love this because it makes it so well organized that you can get to exactly what you need to find without difficulty. So the sections uh, or the tabs, if you will, of the detail page, well, they call it detail because detail is what comes up by default, the detail tab. And it's just got your birth information, your death, your family relationships and so forth. Then we've got a timeline, we've got sources. The timeline shows a map, which is really cool. Um, sources, collaboration, those are discussions that you may be having with other patrons. Memories, where you upload your photos and stories. And then ordinances, where you can see the progress of temple ordinances for that person. We're not going to look at all of those to today for today, but I would invite you, if you've never checked those out, Click on them, just explore and see what fun information is available on each of those tabs. A couple of things I wanted to point out on the person page, which are just really cool features, is that on this page, if you click view tree, that's another way of seeing this person in the root position of the tree view. So we're not going to do that. We're not going to walk through it. But just know that if you want to see that person in the context of their tree, just click view tree and you'll be there. you'll be right there. Follow or unfollow is a very cool feature that allows you to be notified if somebody else makes changes to a person in family tree. Most of the time that you use that is maybe on ancestors that a lot of people are collaborating on and possibly even some people are making mistakes and you'd like to, you know, I have a few ancestors where they maybe are easily confused with other people. So people are constantly doing bad merges or adding the wrong parents or something like that. If you click follow, then you get a notification when changes are made. And then that way you can talk to the person or do whatever you need to resolve those issues. And then the last one, super fun, is view my relationship. This shows actually a graphic of how you're related. So here's how I am related to this John William Bescoby. Sorry, I couldn't fit me on my, this thing was too long, but this is my grandmother right here. And so the path is we go all the way back to her ancestors, Francis Bescoby and Winifred Rodding. And then John William comes through my ancestor's brother. So that's how I'm related. And it also states the relationship here. John is my third cousin, three times removed. So I don't know, whenever I'm helping somebody with family tree, I invite them, you know, helping them do temple names. I invite them to look at this chart because I just think it makes it real how we're connected. We have a real literal family connection to that person that we're doing temple work for. Okay, now we're to the recents list. This is a very helpful navigation feature. It's a drop down list of the 50 people or up to 50 people that you have viewed most recently. If you want to go to the person page, the detail page, click the name. On the other hand, if you want to see this person in tree view, click the tree icon.
Find is kind of what you'd expect. It allows you to search within those 1.3 billion names that are in Family Tree. It's actually not a way to find people that aren't in Family Tree yet that might be in a birth or marriage record. That's what we use to search for, right? But find is a way of finding people that are already in the Family Tree. You can either find by name. So you see here an example of just putting in the name and some birth information, or if you know the ID, you, the PID, you can put the ID number in there and search that way. Here's an example. If I click find now after I've done that, I, the reason I wanted to bring this up is that these search results don't operate exactly like search results on other sites like Google, for instance. Oh, sorry, I'm losing my voice here. Excuse me. I've been talking too much. So we had a little, a cool little discussion right before class. I probably shouldn't have done that because I used my voice too much. So um, the difference between, actually, I take that back. I'm not sorry a bit. The discussion was wonderful. But so when you click find and you bring up search results, people get confused sometimes because they click on a person and they get this, they get the summary card and they think, oh, is that all there is to it? And they don't realize that actually this is kind of what happens whenever you click on a name as we discussed. And the way you get to more information is to click the name or click person. So again, this little summary card in results is just an intermediate step. And if you want to see all that information, you know, more information about the person, then you do have to drill down to their person page. So like we said, you just click either the name or person and you get to this place where you see more information. Following, we talked about earlier how, remember, you can click that follow button at the top and choose to be notified anytime somebody makes a change. Well, if this is where you see all the people that you chose to follow. So if you click following, it shows you this list of everybody that you have chosen to follow. This actually has a lot of cool features that we do not have time to go over today. But we just did a webinar on this. So again, if you will Google, if you want to learn more about this, Google BYU FHL webinars, Family History Library, FHL webinars, and then go to the webinar, the list of all of our webinars and look for the one on following. So it's called the fabulous following feature in Family Search Family Tree. That's how you can recognize it. But this has got so, they just recently upgraded this and it's got way cool additional features that are very valuable to us in doing our temple and family history work. The last one is my contributions. If you ever wonder if what you do matters, click on this because, and if you're a new person, click on this and you may just have a couple of things in it. Then if you stick with this, click on it in a few months and you will be surprised at how little daily efforts really, really add up. That's why I love to see the contributions. You can see how many people you've added to Family Tree. You can see how many sources you've attached, various things like that. So this is just a great way. Sometimes I think we lose track. Like we think our contribution isn't very big, but little things add up. So definitely check out my contributions and check it out from time to time to see how your contributions are growing. And they actually, excuse me, track them over years. So like if you're just starting out right now, then it's going to show you 2021. Next year, it's going to show you 2021 and 2022. 20, 2000. Did I say that right? Do you ever have that like you say something and then you go, oh, did I say the number right? Yeah, 2021, and 2022. So yeah, just know that it tracks all the years of your contributions. So this brings us to the end of our class today. And I just want to leave some parting advice before we start um, our questions. Let me see how much time we got. Okay. So my final advice would be slow down. 
There's no need to rush a lot, especially when we're starting out. We think, oh, there's so much to do. I just have to rush, rush, rush. That's a good way to get discouraged. So there really isn't a need to rush. We just want to be diligent and faithful. And then also be humble. And the reason I threw these two things in is that as a teacher of family history over the last however many years, and also as a state consultant, the time that I found that we all make mistakes in family history and temple work, like we do invalid ordinances, or we uh, merge the wrong people, almost always it's because we've either been rushing or we've maybe not been as humble as maybe we should have because I found that there's been times when I've got promptings that I shouldn't do something in family tree and I'm like oh I'm just in too much of a hurry I'm just going to go ahead and do it anyway well I can't speak for anybody else but on my part that was a little bit of pride right because I was just I wanted to do it my way instead of doing it the Lord's way or the right way so just having that spirit of humility where we really want to um do things the best we can for our family on the other side and we're willing to listen willing to receive correction from the spirit those are two of the things i think help us the most is to not rush and to be humble and to really that kind of leads to the third one um is to seek to learn because when we're humble we are open to learning especially from the spirit so what's next? You can do the activities for this class. And so now I'm going to pop over to my um, link thing here, and I'm going to throw a link in the chat, which will take you to a handout. And this handout has activities you can do, and it also has a link to the slide deck, and it also has a link to a survey that we'd love you to have. But I just realized I needed to say one more thing, and that is the other thing I would encourage you to do, all of us to do, is prayerfully determine where the Lord wants you to work. It may be finding temple names. It may be writing a personal history. In fact, just for your um, just for ideas, I won't bother to walk through all of these because you have the link to the slide deck now. But these are examples of things that you could do to do your family history. So there isn't one right answer for everybody, but the spirit can give you a personalized answer for you, for where you should be working right now. And it's going to change over time. I can tell you that too, that um, you'll be prompted to focus on certain family one time, and then another time to do something completely different, plan a family reunion, whatever it is. The important thing is to follow the guidance of the spirit in what the Lord, what particular contribution the Lord would like you to make to family history. And to be clear there, I also don't think usually that there's just one thing that could be right. The spirit might give you a choice, you know, to, um, to you might feel like you ought to be writing a little bit on your family history and also researching this other family or something. So I don't want to make it sound like, don't do anything unless the spirit tells you and there's only one right thing you can do. No, that's not at all what I'm saying. I'm just saying seek the guidance of the spirit and find that contribution through the spirit that the Lord knows that you can make to family history. And I feel to testify that there is something that each of you can do. You may not feel like it. You may say, who am I? I'm a nobody. I can't. I'm just getting started. I have no contribution to make. May I tell you that that is not true, that you have a contribution to make. And as you seek the guidance of the spirit, as you follow, you know, you're here learning. This is a great thing. This is a great example that you're doing this today. And as you continue growing in your ability to do family history and your ability to hear the spirit, you will make that contribution that the Lord knows that you can make. So that takes us to the end. And I just leave this testimony with you. And because we've been, it's just such a rich spiritual experience today, I want to end by sharing my testimony of family history work and just how much joy it can bring into our lives and how important this is to us and to everybody else on the other side of the veil. And I leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. Sister Grant, I don't know if yes. you were aware, but Family Search created a new 
page for beginners for for Roots Tech, but it's kind of hard to find. I just posted it in the chat. If Thank anybody you. would like to go look at that, it's really good. So Thank you. Yes, I noticed that page as well. And it's a very different experience from what we were talking about today. It kind of shows the information just randomly. So it's a fun way to get familiar with your family. But if you want to do the kinds of things we were talking about today, probably that page, it's a good introduction, but then probably you want to switch over to the other page would be my feeling about it. So because for instance, when you show the family, it pops it up in a little modal, a little pop up on the screen, and it's actually harder to use than the other page. So 